that gets me so hyped, that music. I love that theme song. <laughs> it's so fun. Even yours today, I was like, oh, all right, this is good. This is energizing. <laughs> you need that when you walk into a room. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I need so that good. wherever I go. You do, you do. I actually had the the privilege when I was sharing in Dallas at a, or not Dallas, Dallas was coming. It was Denver um, at a conference, the Embrace Your Ambition conference. And I wanted an intro song that was like going to hype me up. And I had, you know, when you choose those things, you have no idea what's going to happen before you. And you have no right. idea what the ambiance is going to feel like. And so you just have to embrace it like strongly, depending on what that sound is or what those words are. And so yeah. I chose the song, church clap okay. and I made this like massive entrance. I had like a, a row of people run in before me and just get the audience hyped up. And I didn't That's know cool. that the person who was uh, the DJ was going to play the entire song. <laughs> Oh my, I was out of breath by the Sweating, time it was yeah, time. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm done. I literally put the mic down and started walking away because I just danced. I just did a dance performance unknowingly. Thankfully, I like to dance. So it was very energizing. That's awesome. Yeah. So I do it, think if I ever had to pick a theme song. I was song, just going to ask you, let me hear. Because, you know, as especially as men, sometimes we just like we imagine ourselves as wrestlers, like yes. professional wrestlers or professional fighters. And like, and so I've thought a lot about like, okay, if I was a professional MMA fighter, what would I want my music to be as I came out to? And I've just always, for whatever reason, nothing gets me more hyped than the guitar solo in the song uh, by Coldplay, uh, oh, Fix You. I don't know if yes. you ever heard that. that Yes. And then the drums come in. I'm so glad. Yeah, so it's just like if ever I get to have a theme song to anything, I'm going to give them that clip of that guitar solo from Fix You. And it's going to be like, yeah. that is epic. Yeah. That is epic. Now we have to share a stage just so I can witness that experience. So yeah. another stage, because this is also a stage. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so happy to introduce you, Jason, to this incredible community who has just partnered with this vision of a fit in faith for the last three years. It's crazy. I'm already prepping for season four next year as we are literally booked for the rest of the year. And so wow. it's pretty exciting. Um, and I feel like more and more God is just using it as a tool, um, not only to equip the listeners, but to remind us of the intentionality of our time when we get to spend together. Um, and if I fixate more on you and I, then the things that come from that conversation in service end up being so magnificent. But mm -hmm. not often do you allow people into the types of conversations that end up uh, evolving here. And right. so I am excited to help people understand what launched and free is, but more so than that, like who is Dr. Jason Baca and what exactly do you do you do and how do you show up every single day? Yeah, um, so I guess it's a bit multifaceted. The, doctor, the doctorate degree, um, has nothing to do with that, what I actually do in business, as most degrees are when you Truth. get a degree you know, <laughs> doing something completely unrelated. Um, I mean, I guess tangentially. So my doctorate degree is in leadership, strategic leadership. But what I actually do, well, I am a university professor uh, in a graduate school of business. So I do teach, which you usually need a doctorate degree for. But then really what I do is I help uh, Christian business owners, entrepreneurs with their funnels online marketing, uh, you know, the, the number one reason people fail in business, why I failed for so long trying to launch a business is getting people to your business, right? Like sales and marketing is number one reason. Um, so I don't operate so much on the sales side as much as the marketing side. Like how do you get new people to come into your funnel? So I've been working with some uh, business owners and getting that going. So that's pretty much between that and Kelly, my wife and I, we've had three babies. I say, I say we like I had something to do with it. Really, she has had three babies. <laughs> In a little uh, bit. She did all bit. the work. Yeah, a small contribution at the beginning of the process. And then, <laughs> and awesome. then it's all her from then on. Uh, we had three babies in three years. So uh, we went from married with no kids to married with three kids in three years. So uh, between my work and what I do and Ooh. having three babies in three years, uh, that's pretty much what we do every day. <laughs> Hopefully you have been introduced to Wim Hof um, breathing methodology. Have huh. you? 
No. What's that? Oh, gosh. Um, well, it's an alignment uh, process of helping you breathe and come back into center. Um, okay. It can also heal you from the inside out, like to the point where he's been um, proven to be injected with lots of different things. Ebola was one of them hmm. and was able to breathe his way through it. He can change no his core temperature um, based on breath. And mm. he's actually won the Guinness World Record for the furthest travel beneath a ice layer with no wetsuit on um, for a duration of time. Wow. So and he hosts retreats around the world to like immerse your body into the freezing cold environment in order to come back to center. The reason I say that is because I only have two children and that's a lot. And <laughs> yeah. so I had two in 16 months and everyone's always mm -hmm. like, oh, was that an accident? I'm like, no, it was intentional. Mm -hmm. And it's not a good idea. Don't make it intentional <laughs> in your life. <laughs> that's my mother. That's my mother drop here yeah. is, is give yourself some time to enjoy one or the other. But uh, it is a, it's a beautiful journey. And I'm so grateful that they're they're close in age. My brother and I were too. So from a parenting lens, we need to breathe. But we also know from an entrepreneurship perspective, we need to breathe. And I mm -hmm. think speaking to the funnel side of what you do and that introduction piece of how do people come into relationship with you? I'm curious what that looks like for you. So for, do you mean for my business, the clients that I work with, or are you yeah. talking about how I help other people get clients? How you get clients. And then I'm sure there's some symmetry in there as well. Yeah. So my business is still kind of like starting. Like I said, I've been, I don't know. I feel like I've had a revelation lately. So uh, what I teach and what I help other people do is online marketing, which I've been studying and, you know, spent you know, I hate, uh, take it for what it is, spent tens of thousands of dollars uh, over the past five or six years on courses, educations, coaching programs, et cetera, and gotten to a point now where it's like, okay, I feel, I feel like I got this dialed in. And one of the misconceptions, my wife, Kelly, pointed this out to me, I was feeling super discouraged because, you know, I have, I've worked with now like four clients one-on-one, -on -one, and it just hasn't felt like, man, it hasn't blown up like I've wanted to blow up, right? Uh, tell me in the comments if you've ever been there, right? Like you, you feel like you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, and it's just not clicking or getting traction. You just keep hitting walls. And uh, so what she pointed out to me was like, she's like, Jason, really this year is really the first year that you've really kind of put yourself out there and you know gotten clients and gotten it going. Everything else before now has been education has been you learning online marketing so that now you can turn around and teach it to somebody else. And I never really thought about it that way. I had thought about it like for five or six years, I've been trying to build this business and I've just been failing and it's been awful and I'm just no good at this. Thought about quitting so many times. And now I realize like, no, I'm just now like launching the business and, and praise God, I got some clients, got some traction, like things are happening. But you know, I didn't have the benefit, I guess, of a lot of entrepreneurs who already are good at what it is that they want to teach or do courses about or you know do their build their business on. Uh, so it, that transition's a lot easier. If you're already really good at doing hair, it's a lot easier to create an online course teaching other people how to do hair. Like I had to learn, not that I know anything about hair, but- <laughs> <laughs> You guys, if you're watching, he doesn't have hair. Just to clarify, if That's you're right. listening. Bald guy talking, but uh, I had to learn what I had to learn for like five or six years and then get going. So the the way that I have gotten clients now has just been because I am connected to my ideal clients because my ideal clients are entrepreneurs, Christian entrepreneurs, ideally, who are doing some form of online business who are stuck on the marketing. Like the marketing is the thing that's holding me back. Like literally the number one thing that people tell me is Jason, I got the content. Like I'm a pro at what I do. Like I'm, I'm good. I just can't get the marketing figured out. So that is my ideal person to work with because that part's actually easy for me. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's been going well. I've been, um, you know, teaching in different forums, uh, popping in different people's challenges, Facebook challenges and teaching marketing. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's getting going. It's, it's, uh, finally getting some life, but just by way of encouragement to anyone out there who's been struggling with your marketing or business building or trying to launch a business or what have you, number one, it's probably going to take longer than you think. And number two, don't discount the educational process needed in your the inception of your business for you to finally get some traction. Like very, like I think as entrepreneurs, I realize I'm hogging the mic here. No, it's so good. I think as entrepreneurs, we often expect our very first time up to bat 
that we're just going to smash it over the fence and hit a home run. Like it's going to be the most amazing thing. Like never swung a bat before in our lives. Like never even <laughs> seen a pitch. But we're so confident. Aren't but we? we just know that we know that we know like God's called me. I'm destined to this. Like, totally. and, and yeah. And you just assume that your first time up to bat is you're going to hit it over the fence. And what usually ends up happening, this is what happened for me, is you strike out. And all of a sudden now you're left with the, what am I going to do with this disappointment? <laughs> Things did not go how I expected. This didn't, you know, uh, manifest itself. Like I thought, I thought, you know, you even start questioning God. Like I thought yeah. you were behind me. I thought you were going to bless me. I thought you called me to this. Why would you let me fail so miserably and fall flat on my face in front of everybody? And, and what I've, yeah. So just to, by way of encouragement to everybody out there, business building, entrepreneurship, and especially marketing, it's all, it's a skill set that you have to learn. Like it just like swinging a bat at a ball, just like cutting and doing hair, <laughs> yeah, just like and learning and how to tie your shoes. Like, I mean, I love that you use that analogy too. Um, I am not a baseball person at all, uh, but I do know that the batting averages are way less than what you would imagine. Even the best batters in the league, they're only hitting about 30% of the time. So that means every seven swings, they hit one. And right. so if you look at that from an entrepreneurial perspective, and then you look at my rap sheet of opening 10 businesses, and then you see the one that I'm in currently, you know why. And, and failing or winning, either one is a learned lesson, but they're okay with the failure because in that failure, in that swing and miss, they have now got more information. They have mm -hmm. more information to apply to the next one. They also have more adrenaline knowing they're one bat closer to hitting that home run because yeah. it's going to happen. But they have to consistently show up and often, especially as entrepreneurs, because it feels like in that God calling that we're anticipating it's going to happen because he's called us. And I feel that way full, full and full and full and through and through and through. I know that I know that I know. However, he didn't tell me how long mm -hmm. he didn't tell me exactly how he didn't tell me who he didn't tell me where. He didn't tell me when he spoke to me in vision and I'm like, okay, I say yes. And I say yes, whether I'm going to hit today or whether I'm going to strike out. But when you create a life of alignment, you realize that you're moving the needle or you're hitting the ball is not what the world says hitting the ball looks like. Mm -hmm. And so we have to completely remove ourselves from the game, quote unquote, to keep with the analogy. And we have to get into the kingdom mindset and be willing to exchange that one day for a thousand years and that platform that we think is millions of followers and realize that Jason might be the one who allows me based on my marketing strategy that he implemented to touch the million. Mm -hmm. And your support as a kingdom business entrepreneur and somebody who helps escalate the other people who are Christian business leaders, it could be the one that you end up by, by default receiving the goods from, right? Yeah. And so I think there, there's always this mindset change and perspective change that we have to have no matter what our batting average is. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> to get real, uh, I really feel like the Lord humbled me, has humbled me and is continuing to humble me. Um, I don't know like anybody else, but I have always grown up with this sense and this feeling that I was super special. And when I read about the Bible characters, you know, like- You I, are I picture, special, sorry. Oh, thank you. I picture somebody like David, right? And I read the story of David and I think to myself, man, like that's me. Like you just get this feeling, especially as you read about the beginning of his life, that there's just something uniquely special about him, that God sees in him, that God doesn't see in anybody else. He's literally the only person in scripture described as being a man after God's own heart, right? And he rejects Saul, and he picks David. He says, I have chosen for myself a king, right? Saul is like the people's choice. He's the more kingly, royal looking person. And David is, you know, uh, it, it, God doesn't yeah. look on the outside. He looks on the shepherd inside. Boy. Right? Yeah, totally. the He's just some shepherd boy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, you get this feel as you go through the story that that David has just got this unique specialness to him and that God is just going to take him from the field to the throne. Right. Like he's just going to hit. There's my special guy. He's behind the mountain. Nobody knows his name. Even before he kills Goliath. Right. Like his his brothers are bothered by his presence at the battlefield. Like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Like nobody recognizes David as being the special next king apparent. Right. And so I don't know. I guess when I was a kid, I'm reading these stories and I start to adopt that identity. Like I'm super special. Like there's something 
that that like a favor and a chosenness and uh, a specialness to my life that's that nobody else is going to get to live because I'm like the new David of the 21st century, right? Like God is going to make me king or whatever that means. And, and I'm overlooked and nobody pays attention to me, but one day they're all going to see when I'm on that throne, you know? And I, I guess what the way that God has humbled me tying this back to our conversation about business is the reality this, I heard a pastor say this one time in a sermon and it just like hit me in the chest. And what he said was, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you get to skip any steps. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You don't get to skip any steps. And he unpacked that and he went on to say like, like because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you get to avoid certain things in life that other people don't have to go through, right? Like avoid hardships. In fact, we're promised by Jesus that we will go through hardships, right? I mean, if you really want to get real, like just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that we're going to have any less miscarriages than people who aren't Christian, that we're going to get sick less than people who aren't Christian, that we're not going to die someday, just like everybody has to die. Like we all are a part of the same kind of life and story. That's a big picture of what you get in Ecclesiastes. And I guess my misunderstanding as it relates to business is that I was going to be able to skip a lot of steps, that I wasn't going to have to learn how to swing a bat. I wasn't going to have to learn how the game of baseball works. Like I wasn't going to have to learn how to swing and miss and come back and strike out and get back up on the plate and muster the confidence. Like I wasn't going to have to learn all that because the first time I ever put my hands on the bat, it was going to be over the fence in two seconds. And I think, yeah, what I learned and what I've been humbled by over the years now of like striking out, striking out, striking out, striking out to use that analogy is that in business building as entrepreneurs, even kingdom minded favor of God, hand of God on us entrepreneurs, that we don't get to skip any steps. Or if you do, maybe maybe you are that one person who steps up and hits it over the fence the first time. But for the rest of us, we have to learn. All right? Even David, if you look at his trajectory, and this is what I did not see as a kid hearing these stories, is that David, he, he has steps, right? Before he gets to Goliath, what does he tell King Saul? To give him confidence that he could kill Goliath. He says, Whenever a bear or a lion had come my way out in the field, I would catch it by the jaw. Like God gave me favor over the bears and the lions, and this giant is no different. So there was already like practice before he gets to Goliath and he kills Goliath. And there's, there's that confidence in him that he knows he can kill Goliath because I've already killed these lions and these bears. Like this is no different. And when he kills Goliath, he doesn't become king right? There's still more steps. And one of those big, bigger uh, adversities that he faces is now the king is trying to kill him, right? So first a lion was trying to kill him. Then a bear was trying to kill him. Then a giant's trying to kill him. Now a king with an army is trying to kill him. And so there's, there's a trajectory and there's a series of steps. And so to your point, Tamara, like when you have a vision, like David was anointed as king by Samuel as a, as a young man, but that didn't actually take fruition until much later in his life at the age of 30, right? His when he becomes king. And so I think to your point, like just because God gives you a vision or he's anointed you for something, or you know that you know that you know that God has called you to something doesn't mean number one, to your point, that it's going to look like what you think it's going to look like. And number two, that, that you're going to get there the way you think that you're going to get there. And then to my point that you're going to be able to skip any steps. <laughs> to get into where God wants you. You're to so right. And it, you know, there's so many visuals because I'm a visual learner. And I like to apply that visual experience to the listeners in this, in this way. Um, I'm thinking of a ladder, right? Like you can tr maybe skip one, but there's no way you can skip two, right? Like you That's will, good. it won't work very well. Additionally, my husband always says he's an entrepreneur as well, which it's interesting to have two entrepreneurs in the household because you're tit for tat. <laughs> and I usually don't receive what he's teaching me until <laughs> I've been taught. Meaning he's like, I told you, so he's good. He's above me. I love him. He's amazing. I honor everything that he says. But um, in the meantime, I still have to learn it for myself. Mm -hmm. I've found myself to be hard headed. And so he says this thing all the time. He's like, there's 10 steps to every single thing. You can create a 10 step system. You see people do this all the time to help coaches become coaches, mentors become mentors, books are written, platforms are shared, speaking engagements are created. Here's the 10 steps to marketing your business effectively. Here's the 10 steps to dating your one day spouse. Here's the, you know, 10, it's there. However, we do try, especially as entrepreneurs, to skip those steps. Mm. And what happens when you get to the finale of that system? 
you still have to go back and touch each mm. of those things. And so you cannot skip the ladder rung. You cannot skip the steps. And even though we know that every person's 10 step process looks a little different, I am sure God in heaven is in the knowing that there is still a process. And the process is a part of humility, I think, is a massive one. I think empathy through humility is a massive one because I know when I sit with a client now and they're struggling in a financial realm or they're struggling in their marriage, but they have this dream and they want to activate and their kid is acting a fool at home. And like there is not one component to entrepreneurship or humanity that exists. And therefore, there has to be this understanding of biblical principle in order for us to activate as entrepreneurs because we're not just entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We're also spouses and friends and, and siblings and children and kings. And so I love the way that we're saying this, but I want people to also understand that even if you hire a coach with a 10 step system, even if I utilize all of your incredible services, I still am going to have to learn something on my own. Mm -hmm. My husband's still going to have to reiterate and he's still going to have to say, I told you so when I learned myself. And, and I have to be OK with that humility and empathy process because I believe it's a gift. And it allows us when we get to the season of life where we're able to impart all the wisdom that we have. Right. And we're able to give it back in a way that I know we consistently do as entrepreneurs, as kingdom led entrepreneurs, even daily, that there's going to be that that iron sharpening iron experience that I existed where the crown will be placed in mm. heaven. And we're going to have that that 50,000 foot lens on the life that we've led. And honestly, the well done, good and faithful servant comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, kingship or or shepherd, we're all still in the belief and knowing of his his son's blood really is what I want to go with. And to um, add to other, add to that, the steps are for our own good. Yeah. Right. A thousand like percent. David would not be qualified to be king at 30 had he not experienced everything that he experienced. Had he not like taken all the steps, he wouldn't have been ready to kill Goliath. Had he not faced the adversities of the bears and the lions out there, he would not have had confidence in God that God would give him Goliath, right? That's what he says. He gives credit to God. He says, I'm going to kill you, but he says, the Lord will hand you over to me on this day, right? He has confidence to know that God will do that because God has already done that. He's already seen God do that. So as he goes, the steps are for his own good to build his own confidence in the Lord and to, of course, hone in on his skill set, right? He slings a stone and like hits him, boom, right in the face. Like you don't get good at that your first time slinging a stone, right? <laughs> like he's yeah. had some practice. And that's the, that's exactly the word that that word of practice um, mm -hmm. it feels good. But the word that one of our, our people who are here are listening, Kristen, we see you is, is patience. Mm -hmm. Practice feels like, okay, I can step up to that. But patience feels so hard because mm -hmm. it's a time oriented thing that we feel like we can't control. And so you've heard said before, don't pray for patience because God's going to give you something that's going to take you <laughs> a long time to figure it out. Yeah. And so instead, pray for that practice, pray for the perseverance yeah. to be able to endure the time that he's already set over the situation that we are worrying or, or, or confused or misunderstood about. Yeah. I mean, time is going to pass by either way. Whether you're patient or not, like next year is still going to come the year after that, you know, God willing, we don't we're not promised tomorrow, but like patience and perseverance as it relates to business building, especially, but just in life in general, it's like it's whether you choose to be patient or not patient, the time is still going to pass. So <laughs> so do yourself a huge favor and be patient and persevere through the process so that by the time that time does pass, you're ready for the thing that God has called you to do. Yeah, uh, you've been so transparent in like where you are, what you've come through, what you've been working through. Um, I want to hear a little bit of the backstory because this is what this podcast is all about. Like people see the snapshot now of where you are, healthy family, awesome career, stepping into entrepreneurship. How beyond the vision of David when you were little, how do you feel like this entrepreneurial bug was kind of bit and, and how have you stepped into that from a um, testimonial perspective? Yeah. Oof, man, we could talk for hours and hours about all that. I know. I'm glad. Uh, I would say it's twofold. So one is just like basic faith. And we've been on a faith journey, which I could give you the highlight reel in a minute of just like the crazy leaps of faith that we've taken for God and how hard it's been 
like when you take leaps for God, how it's not always a home run on the first one and you're left kind of disillusioned, like, wait a minute, God, we took this huge leap of faith for you. Why are you not showing up like we thought you were going to show up? And then specifically as it relates to entrepreneurship, um, which is, as you pointed out, just one aspect of our lives at this point, uh, how I ended up there. So I would say in the faith journey, um, that's what this podcast is all about, right? Life of faith. So the highlight reel is this. So I got, I was a drug dealer when I was a teenager, um, which no sounds one, more. No one would have guessed that. I yeah. wouldn't have guessed that. That was good. Okay. Keep going. Which sounds, <laughs> it sounds more like, um, I don't know, impressive than, than it really was. Basically, I would just sell weed to other kids. Like, you know, as a, as a teenager. <laughs> You're a I, bad kid, Jason. Yeah. I got pulled into the wrong crowd. I was, you know, lonely, desperate for friends. I was always the fat kid, had terrible acne as a teenager, like always rejected, always overlooked, which is why I- I literally would never guess any of this, you guys. Yeah. I've had, this is not the first conversation I've had. I am so <laughs> excited about this. Keep going. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's why I identified with David so much because David was overlooked, like, you know, like- like his family doesn't even bring him up. Yeah, like the, yeah. the Samuel, the prophet says, you know, do you have any other sons? And his dad's like, oh yeah, there's no. another one. Like, <laughs> you know, like how bad is that? So, <laughs> so anyway, um, that's how I felt. So I, eventually after being rejected by all the cool kids, uh, yeah, I found my, sp my space with the potheads. And so, um, yeah, I resisted for a long time. So I didn't smoke weed until I was like 16, something like that. Um, but finally the peer pressure got, got to me. I smoked weed and it was like, as soon as you get high the first time, you're like, wow, I want to get high again, right? Like that was amazing. That was really cool. You don't know the trajectory yet, right? The trajectory is it's all downhill from here, but you think you've just stumbled upon something really awesome. So anyway, I started smoking weed and it quickly becomes an addiction. And um, it, I just kind of fell into the entrepreneurship of weed because you know I would like buy a bigger bag and then my friends would be like, yo, give me some, give me some. And I'd be like, well, I'll sell you a little bit of my bag for five bucks, 10 bucks. I won't get into all the lingo and slang and terminology. <laughs> I would not be able to follow to be honest. <laughs> but basically that's how it started. And so next thing you know, I'm buying like, like, I mean, like, you know, five to 10 years in prison type sizes of weed. Uh, and then just breaking it out. Like, like the people I'm buying from are actually scary, right? I'm just nice little, you know, 18 year old Jason, with pimples on my face. Uh, but the people, I mean, they had like assault rifles and like, it was like, I, I hated going to buy the weed wow. from them because I would just make me nervous. Like wow. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> so I anyway, that was a red flag right there. Like, mm, I don't think I should do this. Very Intuition, well. not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Discernment, not yeah. there. I get it. I get it. So long story short, um, I'm able to keep this all from my parents somehow. And uh, my parents got divorced when I was four years old. So two separate houses. Um, and my mom finds weed in my sock drawer one day, right? It was like tucked in a sock, stuffed in the back of the, the drawer. And then she calls me. She's like super upset. She's yelling at me on the phone. And she's like, she's trying to, she tried to tell me I was, I needed some socks. And so I was looking for some socks and I found, you know, I just stumbled upon it. I was like, whatever you were looking, <laughs> there's no way you would have found that had you not, not been snooping not. through my room trying to find it. Yeah. Anyway, like the jigs up, I got busted. And uh, so in order to kind of like get her and everybody else off my back, because they had no idea, I had to start going to church, right? Because I wasn't going to church because as soon as I was 12 or 13 years old or however old that I was, when I realized I was physically big enough now that you are not going to physically make me go to church, like I'm not going to church. So, you know, make me. So, <laughs> so I didn't go to church. So now just because of the pressure from my mom, I start, decided to go back to church. Well, uh, and I, and I went back to drugs again. So I still doing drugs and going to church at the same time. And, uh, long story short, I ended up meeting the Lord there getting saved at that church. And this happened like right before I was about to go to college. So it was like the summer of, I was about to go to college. It was like two weeks away from starting college, had a full ride scholarship to a, uh, a local university, university of New Mexico. That's where I'm from. <clears throat> and, um, I felt the Lord called me to Bible school. And so there was one in Texas that had been on my radar. And so I gave up the full ride scholarship. Like if you don't go that first semester, you lose it. And so as a big leap of faith, I said, I'm not supposed to go there. I'm supposed to go here. I packed up the car, drove out to Texas, like no way to pay for anything. Like I, like I was barely <laughs> accepted <laughs> into the school. 
And uh, just so that this highlight reel doesn't take all of our time, I'll just start speeding through. Got open doors, you know, Pell Grants and scholarships and, and loan money or whatever. I got to stay. I went to Texas and I, I uh, went to Bible school. Really got to know the Lord there. Uh, got to know a lot about religion and uh, Texas, Texas's brand of Christianity. Anybody from Texas know what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so had an overall great experience. Got to know the Lord there. So uh, huge. It was a huge leap of faith. So I'm about to graduate. I am not done doing any more school. Like I'm so over school. Like I hated being here and blah, 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 blah. And like two months before I graduate, I feel like the Holy Spirit, like knocking on my heart. Like, I want you to go to more school. And I'm just like, mm, no, thanks. And he just kept prodding and prodding and prodding. And so finally I was like, all right, well, just where do I go? Like, you know, I did some research, came down to two schools. I was walking around what's called a prayer walk. They had like a little park there at the school. I was praying and I'm just agonizing over this decision. And for what might be the first time in my life, I felt the Lord speak to me. I'm praying about school A or school B, uh, Regent University in Virginia or Full Sail University in Florida. And uh, I, I'm like, is it A or B, A or B, A or B? And for the first time in my life, I think it was the first time in my life, I feel the Lord speak to me and he says, I'm with you. And I like fall to my knees, like my heart sinks in my chest. I start bawling my eyes out everywhere because I knew what he meant. What he meant was whether you go to Regent or whether you go to Full Sail, in either case, I'm with you. And so uh, I decided on Regent because it was Christian and way cheaper. So I was like, well, then that's the school I'll go to. <laughs> so I end up going, so I, I pack up the car again, like give up, give away everything I have, pack up the car, drive to Regent. Same thing, no money, no place to stay, like no idea how I'm gonna like go there to school there. Long story short, God opens all the doors and I go to school there. I meet my wife, Kelly there, uh, mutual friends, et cetera, church. And now we've, we're about to graduate. We wanna get married. I'm praying to the Lord, what do we do? Because we, we don't have no place to stay. We need to know where to go. I feel the Lord speak to me again and say, take your wife and move to New Mexico. That's where I'm from, New Mexico. And so I say, okay, I thought that was number one cool because he, he confirmed that I should marry her, right? Like, <laughs> take your wife and move to New Mexico. Um, and so we gave away all our possessions, didn't sell anything. We gave it all away, whatever would fit in our one car that we had together. We drive out to New Mexico. Uh, the only places that we had lined up to stay was I was going to stay with my grandparents and she was going to stay with some family friends because we were keeping ourselves for marriage. Obviously, we weren't living together, or sleeping together. Um, but that was it. No idea where we were going to where are we going to work? How are we going to make money? Where are we going to live once we get married? And long story short, God opens up all the doors. I mean, we had no money, no credit, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt from student loans and all of these things. And God opened all the doors. And we were in Albuquerque. Fast forward again. We're now there for a year and a half. Uh, we just feel this transition for whatever reason, God putting on our hearts to, uh, to, to transition out. And so our lease on our apartment, we, if you're not going to continue, you have to give a 30 day notice. Otherwise it automatically triggers and renews. So we're like, Lord, we're, we're at a, a, a fork in the road here. Do we put in our 30 day notice or not? Having no idea where we're gonna go. We prayed one night and uh, the Lord spoke and said, put in your 30 day notice. So we put in a 30 day notice on our apartment having no idea where we're going to live in 30 days, right? Again, no money, no anything. Uh, <laughs> we give away, we start giving away all our stuff because we know that's the that's the process. Like a week later, a week now into the 30 days, uh, a friend of mine who I had not talked to in years messaged me out of the blue on Facebook. And he was more of an acquaintance than a friend. Basically asked us to go to Chick-fil-A. Hey, can we grab lunch? I'll be in town, blah, blah, blah. And at that lunch, he says, this is going to seem really random and out of the blue, but God put you guys on my heart. And he asked me to ask you to pray about moving to Phoenix to help us with this church plant that we got going on. He's living in Phoenix. He had planted a church. And we said, that's funny because we just put in a 30 day notice on our apartment and we have no idea where we're going to move next. So it was like, you know, total confirmation that we took the step and then God answered, but we didn't, the, the timeline didn't line up for us to quit our jobs and move out there before our 30 day notice was gonna expire. So get this, again, I'm making a really long story longer, but we have to move out. The week we're moving out, my aunt is gonna be out of town for a week. She needs somebody to house sit. So we're like, that's funny because we have to move out that week. So we move, so we move into her house to house it for her. 
Now, like, we bought ourselves another week of time. Like, God gave us a week of time. We're there in her house, not knowing where we're going to go when she gets back, because she did not want us living at her house and crashing on our couch. And while we're there, some other friends call us up and say, hey, we're going out of town for two weeks. We're looking for somebody to house sit. We thought of you guys. I don't know if you're available. Why, yes, we are. And the day <laughs> they need well, us, yes, we are. <laughs> the day they need us to house it is like literally the day or the same weekend my aunt is coming back. So good. From her trip. So we go there. Now we're there. And again, still no money, still no anything, still no idea what's going to happen. Okay. We know that we can move to Phoenix in September, which right now is like August or I'm sorry, July. So it's just a couple more months away. We're like, okay, Lord, what's going to happen here? While we're there for the two weeks, <laughs> We get a call from another kind of acquaintance out of the blue who says, hey, this is random, but uh, we, uh, we're we looking at, we're renting a condo and we were looking to buy a house. We found a house. We had to put an offer in on it like immediately. Just We just needed to, to get it this house specifically. The house is closing, but we still have like two months left on our condo that we can't get out of. But we're excited about this new house. We're ready to move in. So we're going to just move in and our condo is going to be empty for like two months. Uh, I, I remembered you guys were like planning on moving or whatever. Like, would you need a place to stay for a couple months? And it was just like, you know, like, <laughs> why? Yes, we do. And so it like literally ran all the way up until uh, September, which is when we needed to leave. Right. So it's like God provided all that way. Three days before we're about to move to Phoenix, no idea where, like we drive into Phoenix and then what, where do we go? We have no place to stay. Three days before we're, we're like loading up the car. Three days before we get another text out of the blue from somebody else who says that we met one time, say, uh, hey, I overheard that you guys were moving to Phoenix. Um, to That's where she lived. She said, I don't know if, if you need a place to stay or whatever. It just kind of popped into my head. I thought I'd text you. But um, the days that I was told that you guys are trying to move here is literally the day my roommate is moving out from our two bedroom apartment and I don't have anybody else lined up to stay in it. If you want, you guys can have that room rent free. Don't even worry about it until you get your feet underneath you, you get jobs and do all that. And so God opens the door. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly through this. So repeat that process now from Phoenix back to Virginia Beach. We felt the Lord call us back to Virginia Beach, gave everything away. I mean, mattresses, flat screen TVs, like just gave it all away. Drove all the way to Virginia Beach, but while we're driving there on that five, six day journey, have no idea where we're going to stay when we get there. God opens the door. God opens the door. God opens the door until finally, even now where we're at, which is we're living in Pennsylvania. Uh, we were renting a house. The house sold. The landlord sold the house. The buyers who bought the house didn't want to rent it. They wanted to move in. So we had 30 days to leave, pa you know, packed up what we could, gave away everything else that we could. And uh, now we're here in Pennsylvania. God opened the door for us to come up here and live. So. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of the. I yeah. mean, this is like a nomad minister, <laughs> like the nomadic family. And I love that one of the gals listening said that she, great things happen to Chick Fil A because she is an <laughs> owner of one, and it's so true. I have so many great memories of Chick Fil A. Um, and so many great people work there, but I love the the obedience, right? And mm. I love that in your entrepreneurial journey, for some reason, you thought it was going to be a home run. And yet your life has really proven to be another way, right? Mm -hmm. It's been a strike, a strike, a strike, but in a great way, because in those what was strikeout, like people look at debt as a strikeout, people look at like losing all of your materials as a strikeout, right? Or, or giving away even all of your, but you have literally in that cultivation, been in training, right? Mm -hmm. Like for whatever it is that God continues to do. And it's not like when you got to those places, great things didn't happen because doors continue to open. And so I would love for you to talk through this understanding of the one thing that started this entire conversation when you were on that prayer walk mm -hmm. and he said, I am with you. Mm -hmm is the recognition that there were two options and you were praying for something specific. And they tell you like, make your prayers really specific so God can answer them. And he didn't give you a specific answer. Mm -hmm. He just gave you the revelation that I am with you. And how then does that make you perceive? Cause I have my own thought pattern, but I want to hear from you of, of how you make choices on a consistent basis things like giving things away, moving to other states, unknowing to what that's going to look like, saying yes to opportunities that you might not know how those are going to end or open or close or any of the things. How do you choose? Is it based on the open doors? 
Is it based on the abiding piece of I, he's with you, regardless of what you choose? Because I think that a lot of times people think that there's only one path to what God has planned for them and that they can't choose the wrong path. But this proves that that might not be true. Yeah. Well, that's a whole nother can of worms, isn't it? Like stepping into like the theology of the providence of God and the foreknowledge of God and predestination and all of these things. And there's, part... there's his doctoral coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. The So, yeah, I, I guess one quick disclaimer. Keep in mind that during this, you know, we've been married almost 11 years, Kelly and I. During this really awesome, faith-filled joy ride with the Lord, it's been really hard. Not not every day. And yeah, doors open, there's ups and downs. But during that same time that we've been doing all this amazing, you know, leaps of faith, been homeless a couple of times. Some I just mentioned, like, you know, floating around from house to house. It sounds exciting and it sounds fun and God's opening doors. But in the moment, it's it doesn't feel fun not to have a home and a place to go and not having no idea like what's going to happen next, <laughs> you know, not having money, right? It's like, yeah, God gets more glory because we didn't have any money to do these things. We needed God to do miracles, but it's not fun not having money. I can't tell you how many hot dog sandwiches I ate during that, that season <laughs> of life. Oh, that reminds me of my childhood. What That's why to this example. day, like I will never eat another hot dog. <laughs> I do like hot dogs, but I'm coming back around. But there was a while where it was literally a dollar for a loaf of bread and a dollar for a 10 pack of hot dogs. So it's like 10 cents each. And so because we were so poor going on this faith journey, like I would literally buy a pack of hot dogs and buy a pack of bread and I would cut the hot dogs in half and put mustard on. And that was breakfast, lunch and dinner like for a while. And, you know, it's it's not always enjoyable following the Lord in the, you know, like, God's just going to bless your socks off all the time kind of way. And you don't get that when you read the Bible. I mean, the most glaring example of this is Joseph, right? Like, look at the dream God gave him. And he yeah. does fulfill the dream. But in the process, it's not fun, like, to be somebody else's slave. To go from, you know, his, he was the favorite son of a really wealthy family, right? Jacob had all kinds of wives and servants and camels and livestock. And, I mean, was, he was like the, 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 the poster child for the family. And he goes from a state of wealth to slavery, scrubbing somebody else's floors and getting accused of something he didn't do and getting thrown into prison. Not a prison with satellite television, by the way, like this is like ancient days prison where they just forget about you. And so, yeah, like the process is not always fun, uh, especially we felt it the most when we started having kids. Like that's when you really feel the, the pinch of poverty, of, of being poor for the Lord. You know, I remember one story is uh, our son had fallen and kind of like jammed his thumb and his hand swelled up and was all blue. And our daughter, who was, I think, six months old, needed to go in for her six month old checkup. Well, we didn't have insurance. We don't have anything like that. Right. So we call ahead and they say it's going to be uh, 70 dollars. Now, we only had 100 it was like our last hundred dollars, which is actually at that time felt like we had money in the bank because we've been overdraft for so long. Right. So we go to the pediatrician appointment. We booked the two appointments, one for our son to get his hand looked at and one for our daughter who needs her six month old checkup. And we get to the counter. And that's when I realize it's not $70 for the both of them. It's $70 for the two of them. Sorry, I'm about to get emotional. Um, and so when you're standing at the pediatrician's desk and you have to pick which baby gets to see the doctor today and which one has to come back later until mommy and daddy can figure out how to make more money to get you your doctor's appointment. I mean, those are the parts that are not fun, right? Walking through the grocery store with $7 in your bank account and you know you need milk and eggs and bread and that's about all you can afford and you're passing by aisles and aisles of food that you know you have no access to because you, you can't afford any of that stuff. You know, I, I just... Yeah, it's one disclaimer with following the Lord in this life of faith, and this bears out if you, especially throughout the Old Testament, um, is that it's not always fun. Let me put it to you this way. Everybody wants to see God do miracles, but nobody wants to be in a position where they need God to do a miracle. Preach. Right, And so yeah. being in a position where you need God to do a miracle is hard. Now, when he does come through, it's like, you know, 
it's the trumpet is blaring like all glory to God. It's amazing. And your characters are fine. You go through the fire, you're tested, you're tried, all of those things. But to anybody out there who is, is struggling with homelessness or poverty or you, your, you know, uh, ailments, physical ailments in your body. I didn't even get into the whole story of Kelly's, all her digestive issues and chronic illness that we had to battle. I mean, it's been, it's been a lot of stuff. I, I gave you the highlight reel of, you know, I didn't share any of the lowlights, which now I'm starting to go through, but uh, yeah, it is that kind of a journey following the Lord. And it's not always easy. And uh, especially as you have kids and you get married and you want to plant some roots and life gets a little more expensive and a little more complicated, it can be harder and harder to keep trusting God for bigger and bigger things. But to go back to our, the earlier part of our conversation, because we went through those smaller challenges and trials, God now has prepared you for bigger ones. And I think the misconception we get into, and this is, I was guilty of this for a long time, is that if I can just get past this, right? If I can just get past this season, if I can just get through this week, if I can just get my business launched, if I can just get over this hurdle or obstacle, then life is going to be great. It'll be smooth sailing. It's just this one thing that's holding me back from all the goodness and awesomeness that God has for me. But that's not how it goes for anybody in the Bible ever right? It's you go through one thing, like you a lion tries to come eat your sheep to go back to David's story. And then sooner or later, it's a bear that comes to eat your sheep. Like, and you got to defend. And then it's a giant. And then it's a king, you know? And then David's greatest enemy of all, when he finally becomes king, is himself, right? How David almost never gets into trouble until he actually becomes king and is now in the position that God put him in in the first place. You don't hear about any of his sin, from youth until he becomes king. And then when he becomes king, that's almost all you hear about <laughs> is his sin and how, uh, even to his deathbed, he's dying on his deathbed and he's sending his son Solomon as a hitman to go kill his enemies because he won't forgive them. You know, so yeah, I, I don't, I guess I don't know what tr point I'm trying to make here other than it's not always clear. It's not always like a nice, easy, you know, road. It's not always ups. And it won't always pan out exactly the way that you think, but your one hope, the thing that you can anchor your soul into is that God will do every single thing that he said he would do. Before it's all over, he will do everything that he said he would do. So that is your hope in the midst of the process. I haven't seen the promise paid off yet, but and nothing around me looks like that promise is gonna come true or that anything that God said is true or how many times in my own journey did I start to doubt? I don't think you're with me, God. Like you said you were with me on that prayer walk, but it doesn't feel like you're with me now all these years later when I'm praying and praying and feeling like my prayers are hitting the ceiling and I can't get a door to open to save my life. It doesn't feel that way, but the hope and the promise is believing that God is going to do everything that he says he's going to do. So I don't know if that encourages anybody, but. I know that it will. I know 100% that it will. And I know that I, I do these with intention to share them with the world, but I also know that I do them with the heart of um, learning, a uh, heart of being taught. And I didn't know, obviously, a lot of the backstory to that story. Um, and this conversation started in this like high of entrepreneurship and marketing. <laughs> and how do you get into the funnel and teaching yeah. Christian entrepreneurs who are in this mindset of let me take this leap of faith and needing to hear that I am with you and needing to hear that it's not easy and needing to hear um, the valleys. Because as entrepreneurs, especially from a social media perspective, we can see the glory. And when I first met you, uh, I remember sitting in a hotel room and having a conversation in my window facing the, or my computer facing the windows so that I had natural light because I don't have my ring light. I didn't have a fancy mic. And I see the glory of God all over you. Mm. I see it in your smile. I see it in your eyes. I see it the way that you connect with people. I see the way that you're present with people. I see um, the way that you support people, uh, the investment of your time, the investment of your energy. Um, it's all in an act of obedience and discipline. And so that's something that is going to be a testament to your life. It already is. And that's coming from a seemingly a stranger. And so I would just encourage you to lean into the strengths that you have. Um, I feel like those are your stones, right? Those are your stones that are going to continually face the giant. And it's going to be and bear witness to all the brothers and sisters who get to watch you slay the next thing. And so I am certain uh, that this is just the beginning 
and um, you, you've now just put me through your funnel, right? Like that's the <laughs> whole point. Let's go back to marketing and entrepreneurship really quick. He has just yeah. shared, right, the truth of his story. Layer by layer is how you get people into community with you. And so we've been talking on the back channel about like ways that we can work together and help promote one another's you know, businesses and how can we work as a team? And I was willing to work as a team yesterday. That first conversation, I felt that sense of connection. However, this brings me into a closer opportunity and a closer knowing that there is symmetry in where it is that we want to go and how it is that we want to serve. It goes back to our family. It goes back to our spouse. It goes back to our David moments. As you shared, Joseph, Joseph is who I resonate a lot with in the Bible because of my story. And so um, I'm glad that both of those characters were brought up as a reference to you all as the listener to know that the fight is not over, um, but that the army is growing. And so just as Jason and I are coming into connection together for the kingdom on behalf of the kingdom, you as a listener have that opportunity to say yes to deep relationships like this that allow you to link up and um, your, your missions might be different. The visions, the word that God has given you might be different, but all of them create the full vision of heaven, the full voice of God, the full character of God. And it's a, a matter of us staying persistent and obedient and disciplined um, to receive that great reward. Yeah. If I can, I know we're going to wrap up here in a second. Uh, I feel like in my head and in my heart to encourage somebody out there with this. When I ran my very first Facebook challenge, uh, I, we spent, like we put together all the money that we had as yet another, like all in investment. Like God bless Kelly for all of the things. that uh, I, God bless Kelly. I'm praying are, for Kelly, not Jason. For all of Jason's <laughs> crazy dreams. And Jason's got this idea and, you know, he's, he's tried that seven times and it hasn't worked, but this time it's going to work, you know, uh, like <laughs> thank, praise God. For Kelly. Average. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that goes, leads right into my point. Um, bringing this whole thing full circle is that, <clears throat> I had this challenge. It was dialed in like all my funnels in place. Like now I'm like a marketer for real. Like I know what I'm doing, et cetera. And long story short, spent our last penny running Facebook ads to the challenge. And the challenge was full and, you know, it was it was a good turnout, all of the above, but it didn't make any money. And so now the challenge is over. It's like it's done. It's the week later. I'm now just sitting by myself at my desk, staring at my computer. I start crunching the numbers, getting sick to my stomach on how much money we lost. And it was the, the our last money, our last personal investment. And so I'm like, I, I don't know how I'm going to get the nerve to drive home and tell Kelly that like, it's all gone and it's over and nothing happened. And I'm driving home again on the verge of tears, like, Lord, what? I thought this was going to be the thing. Like I've already struck out a bunch. Like when do I finally get to hit home run? You know? And so <laughs> I'm driving home and I have this thought, whether it's the Holy Spirit or not, I don't know, but I had this thought and I want to share it with everybody here. And it is this phrase, it's only a failure if you quit. It's only a failure if you quit. It's like, Jason, if you pack it up now and you say, you know what? I'm not doing this entrepreneurship thing anymore. I'm not doing this trying to launch my business thing anymore. I'll never run another Facebook challenge in my life. Like, I'm never going to do that ever again. Like, I'm just going to quit and I'm just going to leave all this behind and let these dreams die and whatever. Like, then you will have solidified that yes, that was in fact a failure if you quit. But if you don't, <laughs> no matter how long it takes you to get back up to that plate again and take another swing again, you can consider all that money lost not a failure, but rather the cost of tuition, right? Because I did learn a ton by running that challenge and not making any money and like three or four big things. It's like, man, if I had to do it all over, I would change this, I would change this. And so my encouragement to everybody out there is as you're battling through this, journey as you keep swinging and striking out as God is not opening the doors that you thought he was going to open and he is opening the doors that you didn't want to walk through in the first place like as you are moving forward as you're you know swinging and missing it's only an utter failure in your dream of being an entrepreneur if you quit but if you keep going and if you keep believing and if you know learning from your mistakes as hopefully not to repeat them but you just keep the dream alive and you keep hanging on to what God has told you to do it will eventually just look at anybody in the Bible. This is true for entrepreneurship or anything that God has put on your life in general. God will eventually do what he said he was going to do. David did become king. 
Joseph did become great and his brothers and, and parents bowed down to him. Like, like the dreams finally do come true. And so it's only a failure if you quit and you walk away. If you don't, it's just the cost of tuition. It's just like you said, getting information and you learn how to swing better the next time. So, so good. It's been such a treasure to have you on and we could continue to talk for hours, um, but we're going to close this conversation for now and we'll have to do a stay tuned experience because I know that there's more to come. As I said at the very beginning, we'll share a stage eventually. He's actually been on uh, TEDx, so you guys can check him out. And he has an incredible um, website, Wealth of Information, uh, launchedandfree.com. And are you on which platform most for them to connect with you directly? Uh, probably Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, you guys, I just encourage you to get in touch with Jason. I encourage you to see what he's doing, um, personally and professionally and see how you can get involved in it for your business, for your dream. Um, and even just for your prayer walk. Cause I know that he would be one of those people to partner with you in that. So I appreciate you. I am thankful for your testimony. Um, as awkward as that might sound, um, and excited to see how God continues to use it and flourish you and your wife. And I can't wait to get the opportunity to interview you and hear all your stories and testimonies <laughs> with all these same questions. Hot seat. Let's do Hot it. Seat. All right, y'all. Awesome. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.